To introduce myself a little bit more, I like to tell you something about me. My last name is Fertig. And in German, this happens to be an adjective, as um, in English as well. Some translations of this in English are finished, ready, complete, or completed. And this makes me a really valuable member of any team, because everybody assumes that they are then finished. <laughs> Which is not a case, I can tell you, but you can pay me a lot of money to find out that it's not a case. Um, I was born with this name many years ago, and it's partially to the region where I come from that I had to learn after 30 years, roughly, maybe a little bit more, that I mispronounce my own given name. Because in German, in proper German, it's fertig and not fertig. Luckily, there is no word like fertig, so everybody understands it. But it's just wrong. And I had to, well, wait 30 years for somebody to tell me this. It's also nice because I constantly fight with the spell checker. As an adjective, it's a lower letter. With my name, it's a capital letter. So when I write Andreas Fertig, the spell checker always tells me, well, the capital F is wrong here. So. Yeah, nice things, but I like the name. We are here to talk about C++, different language, not German, and specifically about lambdas demystified. I'm just pausing a moment. Take your seats. All right, lambdas demystified, and when I wrote up this proposal, Excuse me? All right. Um, when I wrote up the proposal, I was thinking about how can I express all of this? And it turns out that the topic is way too large for one hour, so I tried to squeeze in the most of it. And I worked a lot um, on this image. And it's partially my girlfriend, which is capable of drawing something, and I put in the dots all the language grammar. So this is lambdas in C++, and I think it's all in one graphic. So if we go from the right to the, sorry, from the left to the right, in uh, the square brackets, we have the so-called captures. With C++ 11, we can do capture by copy, capture by reference. We can do a named copy capture or a reference named capture. We can also capture parameter packs. With C++ 14 then, we got an improvement. We can now have init captures. We'll talk about this later. And of course, we can do that via copy or via reference. With C++ 17, we can capture star this. We will also talk about this later. Interestingly, in C++ 20, so far I haven't found anything that changed in the captures. But moving one step to the right, we have in the ankle brackets the keyword template, which came in with C++ 20. We can have templated lambdas there. It's my class bold, so I'm guessing I'm right, because technically C++ 20 is not frozen yet, but it looks really, really good. We'll talk about this also later. Then in the parentheses, we have the parameters this lambda takes. With C++11, we could pass in built-in types, our own made-up types, whatever we like. With C++14, we got auto. So Jason talked a little bit about this. Then we have generic lambdas. One step more to the right, we have specifiers. With C++11, we have no except. With C++17, we have const expert there, so lambdas implicitly are const expert in C++17. And with C++20, we will have const evil. And I hope I pronounced this right, because it's not evil, it's evaluated at compile time. It's a little bit different than const expressions. Then um, we have the no except thing we will have with C++20 and with concepts, expects, 
and ensures new attributes here. Contracts. Oh, I always confuse them. Thanks, Eddie. Um, and then we have the so-called trading return type where we can specify the type of our Lambda which it should return. And we can now from concepts in C++20 have requires to make Lambdas also part of concepts. And then we have in the second line, of course, the Lambdas body and the parameters we pass in to the Lambda itself. So that's the evolution of Lambdas as we have them so far. If you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. That's an excellent question. So um, what's the difference between const expressions and const evaluation? Um, roughly the difference is that a const expression or a function marked as const expert can be downgraded to a runtime function. While const evaluation is a little bit tied to reflection and here it means it is guaranteed to be evalu evaluated at compile time or it fails. So that's, that's the difference. So why not upgrading the const expert capability? Why creating a new instance? Okay, there, there was a long discussion in the um, Stanets committee about this. There um, was a suggestion for operator bang, which is const expert bang with exclamation mark. Um, there was also discussed um, if you should introduce const expert and in parentheses either true or false to indicate it's a true const expert or evaluated at compile time or not. Um, but mainly they are, they are for different purposes. So after long discussions, it was uh, summed up to be um, const evil. Uh, it's a longer story I, I can share it with you later for the details. Other questions? So then, now you learn the syntax of lambdas, right? As you, most of you already know most of it. Um, let me raise a question to you and let it sink. Is this valid C++? You all see it's a lambda, right? So. It's everything to everything. So, what, what, what do you mean? It's, that, it's the full set. You, you map, you catch nothing, then you do nothing, and it equals nothing. So. It's, it's basically nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's basically nothing. But is it valid? It is with C++20 because in C++20 we will have default constructible lambdas and then some guys like me can ask stupid questions like that. Um, but it's not possible before and what it does is it's a lambda which captures nothing, which has an empty function body and is default initialized. Yes. Why does it need to be constructed? Because I asked the compiler to do it. Or what? what? It's, an it's, an it's, it's an object. We, we get to that part. Um, other questions to that? Why do we fail on the lemma? Because um, technically there are <coughs> minor adjustments to the wordings of the standard, roughly, to simplify it. Um, Let's look at something a little bit more useful, hopefully. So I have a function main, there I have um, const char array hello with the content. Hello core C++. <laughs> All right, so, and then I have my lambda here which captures by reference everything I use in this lambda's body and I'm a happy printf user so I use printf to print out Hello core C++. Nice and easy, right? So what's behind this code? What's happening there? And that's when I'm switching to the tools. And all right, for all those of you who are not familiar 
the C++ inside so far. That's unfortunately impossible, I think. Does this work for you? All right. So, thanks. Um, this is C++ insights. On the left hand, you put in the code as you write it in C++. And on the right, if you press play here, it will give you some kind of view into what the compiler sees, what a compiler does with your code. And in this case, I use it to show you what's behind lambdas for all of those who are not um, familiar with it right now. There are classes, essentially. Um, there are a class with one specialty, and that's the call operator here. This call operator does the magic. We can write lambdas pre C11 our own. They're mostly called callables or functors. And Jason had it in his keynote this morning. It's not hard. We can write it our own, but it's a lot of code to write. And with C11, we can just leave this to the compiler. So the compiler also ensures, of course, that all I like to be captured will be captured um, the proper way here. So in this case, it captures the reference to an array. And in the um, Operator's body, we have the printf, so the body from my lambda. That's more or less the magic behind lambdas. There are some uh, special things to know, like we do not know the name or the type, the name of the type of a lambda because the compiler makes it up. The standard um, says that all captured variables have to be private, but it can either be a struct or a class. Um, C++ Insights uses Clang tooling, and there it is a class, but it can also be a struct. Members have to be private. And below here, then, we can see, OK, of course, invoking the lambda means invoking the call operator here. Questions to that? It's all clear. Excellent. So then let me raise another question because when developing C insights, I came across um, very interesting parts of the language. This is a Simple, yet not so meaningful code fragment here, but it's complete and it compiles. And my question is, in how many places can lambdas be appear here? It needs to be compiled, but it doesn't need to be necessarily be what you would write, okay? I have a two here. Do I get more? Four. Five. Oh, excellent. Anybody willing to give me more than five? Five is the number. Because, of course, I can initialize my variable x with a lambda, which is directly invoked. And I can have in the initializer of the four a lambda, which does something like printing start in this case. And then I can use a lambda to increment whatever there is to increment. And I can print and or after here. And I can use the lambda in the body of the for loop. I discovered this when trying to make lambdas rock solid in C++ insights. And believe me, they are still not. But it's an interesting part where you can put lambdas in all over the place. Not saying it makes sense. It's just possible due to the language. Another example here, I have my global variable x, um, my function main, and in that main, I am using a lambda incrementing x. If you look closely, this lambda does not say mutable, nor does it capture anything. Yet, 
it works. It works because the rules for lambdas and capturing global variables are special. And very good for us because global variables are accessible all over the place. Okay? I can access them anyway, so I do not need to capture them. And it's also some kind of trap because it's very hard to actually capture them. Even if I would have used an equal sign here for my lambda capture, it would still say, no, it's a global variable. I spare you all the extra effort in terms of size of your program and instructions. It's there. You don't need to capture it. So global variables are somewhat special to lambdas. Is this all right, or do you like to see it in C++ insights just to get a bit more feeling for it? Excuse me? No, let, let, me, uh, let me show it in C++ insights. So here we have the example from the slides. And if I do transform it, then we can see that this lambda, in fact, captures nothing. Okay. I also ask for nothing. Yet, um, I have my x in here. And it will be used as normal. Even if I change this saying, okay, I like to capture this by copy, the compiler still says, no, it makes no sense. You can access this this variable anyway. If I put x in a namespace like like this. Yep. Wrong spelling. Ah. Oh, above, okay. Don't do live coding. It's not that amusing for everybody, I think. It's still a global variable. The namespace is, well, just some kind of narrowing it, but it doesn't change a thing. This is particularly interesting because you cannot easily capture that by copy, even if you like to pass it around. You are talking about init captures, so something like um, that changes everything, of course. Get rid of the namespace here. Because now we, thanks, good eyes. Ah, okay, now it's non-mutable. Now I have to make it mutable because now it's a member of the class and therefore it has to be mutable. When? No, in, 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 so, so getting back a little bit from which, which, par, um, which example you are talking from, from this one. So this one, um, if I, yeah, yeah, I saw, thanks. So now it's working. Okay. And what you got with this is, with this syntax, it is a copy inside the lambda. So I cannot access the yes. global value. And every time I invoke this lambda, it increments the value inside. Mm -hmm. So, so far so clear. And what's your exact? So, why, so basically, mutable is uh, requires this uniformity space. 
it's strictly required if you capture by copy because then it's a member of the class and the uh, what changes um, here for example to, to make it even more silly but look for the call operator and now I'm taking away the mutable and now it's const right so that's why it has to be mutable in this case and then it, the mutable is not applied to the member it's applied to the operator itself other questions All right, what we also can have are captureless lambdas. And they can be assigned to a function pointer, which can be nice. So if you happen to have or come across a function pointer which later need, needs to do something, excuse me, um, then you can assign a captureless lambda to it. And it's a nice and easy way to keep the functionality at the smallest scope as possible because if you don't need a function uh, lingering around somewhere then this is a nice way and with the uh, captureless lambdas there comes a specialty in why is it better than auto that gives auto as strong typing strong typing <laughs> so this is the example and what you can now see is there is some additional function. Um, I'm taking this directly from Clang. The, the standard says it's called somehow invoke. And it's a static member function. And there is also a so-called conversion operator, which does the conversion from this lambda to this static member function. And that's how it gets assigned to the function pointer. All free for us, so to speak, because we have to do nothing. We can just assign it. It's, it's really nice, and it's the way we can have stronger typings, or we can use lambdas with, for example, legacy API, where we have to pass in function pointers. Of stud, stud function or... Um, yes, std function is, I believe, for, for many other cases, but th this is one where lambdas can reduce it, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's different because uh, std function allocates, lambdas do not, so it, it varies, and you can reassign um, functionality to the lambda, uh, to std function. Yes, yes, so in... Uh, no, it's not in some global space. It's tied to the lambda, and it's the same, um, the same body content as the lambda. So in, in this case, I have two um, possibilities. I can invoke the call operator, so I can use this lambda just as usual, but I can also assign it to some entities. And... I put this in, um, even that I'm not a fan of default arguments, but technically we can, of course, use Lambda as default arguments. We can do some rubbish stuff like this, just to have Lambdas in there, to say, okay, my function x, um, and my, my function func has a parameter x, which is default initialized with a Lambda, which just initializes it with the, lamb with the value two times epsilon. Of course, this also works for function pointer parameters, which can also be default initialized. The difference is here I do not have to invoke the lambda directly. I just pass the lambda into it. But enough about this. Um, speaking a little bit about sizes. I have here an example of a lambda capturing three values, A, B, and C. A and C are of type char. Um, B is of type int. For the question, assume it's an x64 bit platform we are talking about. And the question is what's the size of this lambda? Sorry. 16, I have. Some other numbers? Probably 
times double or the 64 the uh, captures double the charge. Eight bytes? Uh, eight bytes, it's what I like to have in my... Uh, We are, we are getting to the, the re reordering, right. So integers on a x64 bit platform are still 32 bits because it's not a long. So essentially to the padding rules and to the alignment rules, it's three times an integer. So it's uh, three times four byte, summing up to 12 bytes. So this lambda occupies 12 bytes of nonsense, of course, because it doesn't anything but trying to make a point here. And this idea already pointed out, Oh, um, this has nothing to do with lambdas. This is um, according to the C and C++ rules. You need to pad the last char also because this whole and in, in this example, because F will be a class, I can have arrays of that. So it will be padded. And we can work around this by just reordering the use of the variables which is probably not always possible. Um, you can also influence this with init captures. So if you give the order in the init captures, you can nail this down. Yes. Um, this is a very good point, and I was waiting for someone shouting at me, but this is undefined behavior, right? So nobody did that so far. So here is what the wording of the standard says. An implementation may define the closure type differently from what is described below, provided that this does not alter the observable behavior of the program other than changing the size or alignment of the closure type. So yes, the compiler would be allowed to do that. Um, personally, I think it's just for now the easiest way for them to do it. Take the values in as they are because maybe when we're doing the captures, we uh, assume that we just increment one and then the other and, and they have to be initialized, things like that. I'm not sure, I think in, in the future, compilers will be able to do it if it makes sense. So, but be advised, this is technically implementation defined behavior. So switching to C++ 14 where we got generic lambdas. Generic lambdas allow us to have auto as a parameter. And funny story, I am uh, also give trainings about C++ and a lot of them are for people coming from pre-C++ 11 times. So I have one exercise for them where I give them a small code fragment and tell them, okay, now that I've taught you about auto, put in auto everywhere you would apply it, okay? Just to get a feeling. And honestly, in each and every class, there is at least one person when you go through it, who says, well, but why didn't you put auto in the parameter of this function? And when the first time um, this happened to me, I was, no, it's, it's not possible to put it into function parameter. It's just not allowed. And he says, no, 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 it's, it's working. It compiles. And then I was remembering and I asked him, you're using Clang, right? And he said, yes. I said, no. Sorry, I'm not sure if it's a bug or if it's a feature, but for a very long time knowing Clang now, I know that it is allowed there to put in auto as a parameter. And what they are doing is they're creating a template out of it. So now that we are um, seeing concepts coming, maybe that's a good thing that they already have the engine for that, but technically um, speaking, it's the only place where it's allowed are generic lambdas. So, what can you do with generic lambdas? We can do a lot of things because now we can use them in generic code. They can take an arbitrary type because essentially what happens behind this
and I worked hard to get this right in time for core C++, is that we have now an operator which is an operator template. So what the compiler generates for us the moment we specify auto as a lambda's template parameter, it generates an operator template for, our, for us with either one, two, three, how many parameters we named um, with the types. So it's, it's amazing, I think, often how easily um, the sanity committee managed to squeeze in nice and helpful features for us by using old facilities, just letting the compiler do something for us and <coughs> dropping the need for us to write it, to spell it out. Excellent. So, generic lambdas. What can you do with them? Well, one thing I came up with because um, we are now knowing that's essentially a operator template, we can use C++17's const if to decal type the type of the parameter and to do something different based on the type in this body of the lambda. So we can say here, okay, if the type I'm passing into this lambda happens to be of type double, then I multiply my value v with 2.0, and if it's some other type, hopefully not a stood string, I multiply it with two. Because it's a template parameter, I can use all the magic that comes with context brave, just to give you something to think about. Here's something else, which I call the dangling reference trap. I have a small piece of code here. I have my variable x, which is initialized with 22. I have my lambda l, which captured by reference. And in its body, it multiplies x times x. And then I return this lambda. OK, what happens? I'm returning the lambda here, right. So, what is this? It's a dangling reference. Is it undefined behavior? When you execute it, not when you're returning the lambda. Is it undefined behavior when I'm executing this lambda after I returned it? No, yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> It depends is always a good answer. Assume the execution is later. I'm, I'm returning this lambda. And here's a quote from the standard, I'm, I'm, and I'm not sure if it's my favorite quote I've ever seen in the standard. If a non-reference entity is implicitly or explicitly captured by reference, invoking the function call operator of the corresponding lambda expression after the lifetime of the entity has ended is likely to result in undefined behavior. So how nice is this? With undefined behavior, if things work, you don't know why. Now, if it's likely undefined behavior, you don't know a thing. It's still undefined behavior. And I'm, I, I believe it's some weird architecture we are talking, which may have the stack. Jason? Maybe it's only likely undefined behavior, but actually accesses that inside the call operator. You are the native speaker. So maybe it's in the... No, but, but the English one. So, okay, so Jason points out maybe it's only um, likely to result when I'm invoking the call operator. I'm not sure. I just thought it's, it's really funny that we have likely undefined behavior. It's even worse than undefined behavior. Then I have no clue what's happening. Okay, we can fix this. 
of course, you all know this, we can capture by copy. Then we are safe, right? That's what everybody tells you. Just capture by copy and you're safe. And then a new colleague comes in and he or she is a real fan of doing things differently. There's a new task. Now our X is a pointer with probably allocated memory and also initialized to 22. The lambda is adjusted. Now dereferences the pointers. And oh yeah, then somebody says, delete that thing, that pointer. I don't need it anymore. Ouch. Yep. Capturing by copy is not that safe, but using smart pointers would be. All right, has nothing to do with lambdas in that case, but smart pointers can really be helpful. And in this case, it must be a shared pointer if you do not like to move it, sorry. Yeah, but then I have to say move. Yeah, yeah totally sure. Yeah, otherwise I can't capture you. Yeah, I have to move it into the lambda, right? But at that point, I'm losing the reference outside, and I assuming I am using it in the context later. On. So talking a little bit more about captures, here's a bigger example. Somehow, now I have my class test. And in the constructor, which takes a parameter, I have this lambda, which captures by reference, uh, sorry, by copy. And I have two printfs printing out what, when the lambda is invoked, it returns. Before and after incrementing a by one, which is a member of the class. Okay? So, what does the printf say? So the same value twice means two times four. All right? You can all come to my classes or to Jason's. In fact, <laughs> it's four and five. Capturing it's capturing this. Yeah. It's a real, real big pity here. Big it's a big problem, right? Because the impression is totally right. I'm capturing by copy. But what it does is, in fact, capturing this and then not by copy, because it's a pointer. Um, we can fix this with C++17 using stardis, which you can, well, tell yourself as dereferencing this and then capturing it. So now we have a real copy of this inside the lambda, and now it's safe to modify the value outside of it, and we will not see any effects of this. Yes, Jason? I'm getting to that. You're right. The comment was, I'm now copying the entire disk, which is entirely true. No, not really yet, but let's, let's talk about this later. Maybe I overlooked something. So, I'm capturing the entire disk which becomes interesting if my class gets bigger. So before it was a baby example, now it's, well, some kind of kid example. Now I have two variables in it, and this increases the size of my lambda now. All I like to do in this lambda is to capture A, and not everything in this lambda that may invoke smart pointers. Maybe it doesn't work because there's a unique pointer in it, things like that. And that's not what I like to achieve here. So, what can I do is using, going back, using C14 and using init captures. Now I can say, okay, within this lambda, please provide me with a variable called a1, which I initialize with a, and then I can refer to a1 in the lambda. I choose deliberately a1 here because what you can technically do is say a equals uh, a equals a. Then you have 
a member A in your lambda, which is not the A outside. This is sometimes also confusing. So I choose this example here. And how does this look like? like this. Now the compiler generates a variable for us called a1. It uses auto to deduce the type which comes down to int and other than that it looks just like a normal lambda. This is how you can avoid capturing the entire disk and still getting a copy gets all a little bit easier if you just like to get a reference. The const expert comment. Ah, there was a const expert comment in the code, so you are referring to this. Um, this is another longer story and I'm slightly running out of time. Um, there is no rule in the standard which specifies what compile time and what runtime is. And because I'm using Clang here, Clang takes that to its advantage and it can flip the decision whether a function is const expert or not um, during evaluation. In the end, the result is stable, of course, and at this point, I'm not sure if it's const expert or not because the AST I'm using for C++ insights is too early to really be sure. So I have some examples which say that they are const expert, but in fact cannot be. That's why I put this in a command here. Once more about sizes. What's the size of this lambda? It's still in my class test. Um, I'm still capturing this time with the equal sign. I'm capturing the member A but this time I added something into the lambda's body. I have my variable or my array int x of size size and size is a parameter from the constructor's body. It's a really advanced question. Usually you don't need to know this. It's just if you really care about the size of your lambda. So let's simplify that question. Is size captured here or not as part of this lambda? At one point it will do that, yeah, it will substitute size with two. The important part from the standard is in this context, size is not ODR used. So it is not captured in the lambda's body because I'm not using it in the common sense. Here's what I call the sleeping lambda because I experienced that one, once at least. I have the lambda A to F, and they give you the complete program here. It's int main. Um, there's a std string called foo in it. And all the lambdas A to F, they capture either by copy, by named copy, by reference, or by named reference. And some of them print out the content of foo, others don't. If you're looking closely, none of these lambdas is really invoked. There are no parentheses invoking one of these lambdas. Compiling this, assuming the highest warning level available, my question to you is, how many unused variables warning will you get? <laughs> we agree that none of these lambdas is used, right? Seven is too much. Three sounds right. So you will get an unused variable warning for B, E, and F. 
And why is that? For example, in A, I capture by copy and I use foo inside. And because it's a std string, in a std string on copy, there's an allocation and a copy from our data. It's a so-called side effect. The compiler is not allowed to optimize this away. Otherwise, it could optimize away all of our copies from a std string. So this essentially sticks in the code. While for B, I capture by copy, but I do not use anything. So nothing to copy to capture here. Empty lambda. For C, I think it's obvious it's the same as A. For D, it gets interesting because there I capture by copy a named variable. Even if I'm not using it, I get a copy. So that's why this sticks. And for the reference cases, I think it's simple. I'm not capturing anything there. And I have to rush a little bit now. So with C++17, lambdas get implicitly const expert. And this here is C++14 code. The main point is my example below. I have my int array, which I initialized with a couple of um, numbers, and then I have my all 11, uh, all even me, variable, which uses the all of algorithm and the lambda to check if all the numbers in this int array are even. Okay, as simple as this. Now one might ask, why are the hell are you giving me all this algorithm code above? It's in the standard library, right? But as of C++17, unfortunately, these algorithms are not const expert yet. So I had to put in the const expert. My lambda now is in C++17, so the uh, code in main I can write, but I need to provide my own implementation of an algorithm, which is, well, not good. This is the C++17 version, uh, excuse me, C++20 versions. There the algorithms are now const expert, at least nearly all of them. Yeah, a few are missed, I think, but also std array is const expert now, and we have a const expert begin and end. So I can do this nice and easy with just a few lines of code, all that compile now. Thanks to implicitly const expert lambdas. How can we apply them? This is an example from C++ Insights, and I use it to do some code before and after invoking the lambda. So because I have a lot of places where I have either to insert curlies or parentheses, opening and closing, and in the middle some code, I use this function template, which takes a lambda to inject the parentheses or the curlies before and after, and then execute my lambda's body. I can do the same thing, um, passing an argument to this lambda. This is when I'm building up a parameter list, which needs a comma, and all these two cases simplified my code tremendously, because otherwise I had this code duplicated in many, many places. It's also possible to um, use lambdas um, in a so-called immediately invoked function expression. Here I'm using it to const more variables. Because I have some clang trickery to do here to figure out which type the variable has. And if it's a lambda, then I have to come up with my own made up name because what clang gives me internally is not what would compile or I just return the name of the class. Thanks to the lambda, I can now have this std string to be const. Other options, of course, would be um, using a function or just having a non-const version of name. I like this version. Something about resources and cleanups. Have a short look at this code. It's merely POSIX API. I have a read data function which opens a file. If the open was not successful, it directly returns. Then it reads something from the file. Um, it checks if the read was successful. Then it adjusts the file pointer. 
and then it closes the file and returns the value. Anything problematic here? Excuse me? Line 13. Right, I'm not doing a close here, right? I'm missing a close to close the file descriptor. So I can add in line 13, of course, a close, but if the example gets bigger, I have to insert it in many, many places. And we are in C++, we have constructors and destructors, and now we have lambdas. And with the guideline support library, there comes in a small piece of code called finally. And here I'm using finally to declare a variable cleanup, which I pass a lambda to it, which captures by reference, it checks if FD is open or not, and it has to, uh, to call close. The implementation behind finally is more or less simple. This is a simplified version, but it's like this. I have a class template which takes a template parameter t and this t is stored in the class via the constructor and invoked in the destructor. And with that I can pass functionality into that class and I'm sure that when the destructor runs it will be invoked. It's really nice for cleanups. Yes? Yes. Um, it is because I'm certain that this compiles, but I may have turned C++ 17 or 20 on at that moment. So I only have five minutes. I take questions later. But I'm probably running out of time here. Um, let's skip this. So what can we look at? Here are some other cool stuff. So with C++20, looking a little bit in the class bold, we can now have the ability to capture parameter pack expansions and apply functions to it. So what we can now do is we can have this invoke later function template, which is a variadic template, so it can take arbitrary number of arguments. And I can now say that I like to capture all the arguments parsed in, I forward them, into the lambda, and there they are called marks. This was not possible before. The stood forward was not possible, applying a function to it in the context of lambdas. And we also will have templated lambdas. Look at this. This is the C14 version. I have a lambda more or less doing what max does. It takes two parameters, x and epsilon, and it finds out what a maximum of these two values is. This does not a real good job because now I can pass in an int and a double as in the last line and then I will have some implicit integer conversions. Yeah. With concepts, things may change. Uh, again, I have no example with concepts, yes. So just with templated lambdas, I can now say, OK, I have a type name t for my lambda, and both parameters are of type t. That's far and easy with, without um, templates. What can I do with that? I can, for example, now say that I have a lambda taking a std vector of type t. With generic lambdas, I can just say I take anything in. Of course, maybe this concept, I can't do this even better. And I can also now say, because it's a template, I can let it deduce non-type template parameters. Um, as in the second example, where I take, where this lambda takes a std array of type int, but a number of elements is deduced by the compiler, by the template. Finally, I can do this, at least in GCC, with C++14, because GCC allows auto in parameters, but it's a different story. So we will have default constructible lambdas in C++20, and this is the code without 
default constructible lambdas in a decal type expression. I have my std map and I like to have a custom compare function. And what I had to do before C++20, I have to write my lambda before my std map and then say decal type compare, which is the variable I assign my lambda to in the parameter list of my std map. That's all right, but it can get better. In C++20, we can now say decal type and then write the whole lambda. And honestly, while preparing this talk, I thought about whether I like this or not. I like it for simplicity reasons. But now I can start programming in a decal type expression. And I'm not really sure if that's a good or a bad thing. Can we overuse lambdas? Of course, I've shown you the example with the for loop. Um, this is one example, of, again, from C++ Insights. I had something different in mind when writing this code. And if you look at this closely, that I put in a lambda there makes absolutely no sense because it just essentially returns the value you already have. It's nonsense. So this would be an appropriate version. However, I don't know if Clang tooling is already able to find such nonsense lambdas. So we can add unnecessary stuff to our lambdas, to our code. And Adi tells me the time is up. I have two slides left. So if you're interested in lambdas, there's work of others. Um, it's not a complete list. It's just what I came across when preparing this talk. And there's a lot more material. Go watch Bjorn Fowler's talk um, about high order functions where he uses lambdas a lot. It's really nice. There is a nice blog post from Vittorio about compile time iterations with C++20. We have, of course, Jason's uh, lambdas, uh, the key to understand everything in C++ from its C++ weekly. There are a bunch of uh, other episodes also about lambdas. And there is a really nice blog post, two-parter, about lambdas. So with all that said, there are three words left for me to say. I am fertig. <laughs> Thank you.